So a few weeks ago, I was visiting some clergy friends in Dallas, a couple, and they said, so what are y'all doing for Lent? And I mentioned this series and how it's questions Christians ask. And she said, uh, so what are the, some of the questions? And I named some of them. And when I told her that mine was on what happens when we die, she said, ooh, you draw, draw the short straw, huh? Well, actually, <laughs> I didn't really think of it that way. Um, I would say the first week when Carla did, why do people suffer? <laughs> That's a pretty tough one. And maybe what happens when we die is tough or tougher. I'm not sure how you rank it, but I actually picked it. So if it's the short straw, then that's that's on me, right? I think one of the reasons I chose it, though, is because while I was on study leave the first six weeks of the year, I've actually been working on a book that deals with death, but with a kind of a twist. I've not been working on a book on what happens when we die. I've actually been working on a book on how should we live before we die? But because I've been working on it, death's at least a part of the equation, so I've been reading about it, I've been thinking about it. That's the kind of the basic premise. Um, so just to let you know, because I'm a theologian and I can't help it, uh, there's actually a word for this. This is called uh, eschatology. It's the study of last things, which includes what happens when we die, but also what's the future of the earth and is there such a thing as judgment and reward and how does all of that unfold? And I'm not the least bit embarrassed to say that I like to share words like eschatology because in my experience, most people who know nothing about law or medicine, at least in their own practice, their vocation, they know the vocabulary. They know what probate is and they know what a will is and they know about an argument that's sustained they also know about all kinds of medical terms. So why shouldn't Christians have some kind of vocabulary to talk about things like what happens when we die? What I want to say about it is there are some things we know and there are some things we don't know. In fact, what I really want to do is share kind of three sets of statements, a kind of what I know and don't know, another set of what I know and don't know, and then last, uh, what I know and don't know. So hopefully that'll make sense as we go along. Here's one thing I know. One of the best stories I ever heard on national public radio happened years ago. Robert Siegel was the host of All Things Considered. Three days in a row he had on people who were scholars, experts, in the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. And every day it was about, what does your tradition believe happens when we die? I don't remember a thing about the Christian or the Islamic scholar, nothing. <laughs> don't know what that says about me, but I'll never forget what Rabbi Joseph, Joseph Telushkin said. Siegel puts the question to him, so what do Jews believe happens after we die. And Telushkin said, ah, those who know aren't talking, and those who are talking don't know. Now that's really clever. The only people that could know what happens are the dead, and the dead aren't talking to us. And the ones who are talking, like me at the moment, we don't know. It's one of the best stories I heard but the fact is, my don't know statement to go with this is, I don't know what happens when we die. In the sense of knowing, I've read stuff, I have theories, I can tell you what some of those theories are that theologians have put out there for years, but I don't know. None of us knows. This is going to be one of the things that I think your group will find worth discussing. How do we talk about something that can't be known? Okay, so then I have a second set of known and unknown. And the first part of that is, I do know this, that both Testaments give different answers. And not just old versus new gives a different answer. There are multiple answers in each Testament. So, for instance, among Jewish scholars, there's this thing called Sheol. You may have seen that maybe somewhere in the Old Testament. And it was this place of nothingness. So one view of death in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, is there's nothing. We cease to exist. 
There's, you go to this place called Sheol, but there's nothing. Another view is, well, there's resurrection. That, that's a view that was held by some people, uh, some Jews. And then a kind of a, a different version of all of these is there's some Jewish thought that says, well, they live on in the stories we tell about them. And so if you go to a synagogue on a Friday or Saturday, you'll hear how they are attached to those who've gone before. They keep those stories alive. And that's one view for them. Well, in the New Testament, when you turn to that, again, tons of literature to go through here, but the Gospels and Paul, they don't give the same answer. For example, there is this notion in the New Testament that when we die, we go to be with God. We go to the bosom of Abraham. We go to this heavenly comfort, this reward, and it happens the moment we die. But sometimes there's a passage that says, oh, well, the dead are waiting for the final resurrection. They're waiting for Jesus to come again. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. Well, now, which is it? You can't have it both ways. So both Testaments, if you take that you know, smattering of, of survey there, they give different answers. So here's my don't know statement. I don't know which one of those to believe. I don't know which one of those to hold on to and to say, this, this is my position. I mean, do you just vote based on, I like that one, I don't like this one? Is that how it is? It's the People's Choice Awards? I, I don't know. Again, it's the I don't know kind of statement. My third set is this. I do know that I trust God and God's good care. I don't know what happened to my mom or is happening to my mom who passed away from Alzheimer's some six, seven years ago now. I don't know. But if there is some life after, I trust God to take care of her. That's a faith position that I have. Am I totally on target there? I don't know. But I trust God's good care. The thing I don't know is what you're thinking. I wish I knew that. When I taught at the seminary, I was always trying to kind of read people's body language, their eye contact. If they kind of scrunched, I would, you know, say to, to the person, what are you thinking? What are you processing? I can't see you. I can't read your body language or what you're thinking, but this is what's great about these small groups. This is your chance to say, well, here's what I think. Here's what I want to share with the group. And I'm kind of envious of you for that. So I have two questions for you that I hope that your group can at least tackle. My hunch is you'll have a bunch of others that splinter off of these. But the first one isn't directly related to the topic. It is, but it isn't. Here's the question. What do you make of the Bible's conflicting answers on topics? So you could say, well, given what Mike just said about the different views in the Old Testament and the New, what do you think about the conflicting answers? But I think you could also even step back and say, what do you even make of the fact that the Bible can have conflicting answers? For a lot of people, their religious education, their religious journey was, the Bible is this sacred book, and if we could just de decode it, decipher it, we'd see the answer. But as a lot of scholars have noted, it's not really a big book, it's a little library. It's a little library of 66 documents written by different authors at different times, different cultures, and they have different theologies. How do you process that? The second question, pretty obvious one, I guess. What do you think, not know, what do you think happens when we die? It's worth sharing that if you're willing to. Um, maybe it's something you've read. Maybe it's something you don't know what happens. And here's, you could eliminate and say, well, I, I can tell you one thing. I don't believe this one, but I'm not sure about these. And, and so you can share. The thing I would just kind of close with is this. The book that I've been working on is what would it mean to live before we die, which is the flip side of the equation. One of those things is that the relationships we have really matter. Before you die, we should have meaningful relationships. And one of those relationships 
is with you right now. It's friends, it's church folks sitting in a circle, sharing life together. And that's a good thing. Grace and peace. I hope you have a great discussion.